Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our Processing in Memory course. Today, we are going to talk about benchmarking and workload suitability on a real-world processing in memory architecture. Remember that in our previous lecture, we talked about programming a general purpose processing in memory architecture. And in particular, we focused on the admin-based PIM systems. An admin-based PIM system, as you may remember, is composed by a host CPU that is connected to several VRAM DIMMs that um, work as the main memory and also some DIMMs of PIM-enabled memory. In, on each PIM-enabled DIMM, there are uh, several chips, and inside each of the chips, there are uh, several uh, DRAM banks called NRAM, and connected to them, there is, there is a in-order pipeline called uh, DRAM processing unit or DPU. Remember that the admin based PIN system follows the accelerator model, where the host processor needs to explicitly copy data from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory and then launch the kernel execution on the memory side by uh, using a specific command. After that, the, the, uh, the processors in DRAM perform. Uh, operations, execute a kernel, and at the same time, the CPU can check continuously uh, when the kernel on the memory side has finished. After that, the memory banks on the, on the PIM enabled memory uh, become again accessible to the uh, host processor, and the host processor can retrieve the results and move them, copy them to the main memory. Remember as well that we talk about some pro, um, programming examples, and the first one that we covered was the vector addition. In vector addition, what we do is uh, equally partitioning the input and the output arrays and distributed them over the available DPUs in the system. And inside each of the DPUs, we uh, also distribute the workload among, among the available software threads or tasklets. Remember that a key reference for uh, learning how to program general purpose uh, PIM architecture as the admin uh, based PIM system is the uh, user manual or programming guide that you can find uh, in the admin SDK documentation. Remember as well that we gave like four uh, general programming recommendations, the first one being executing on the DRAM processing units or DPUs portions of parallel code that are as long as possible. Second one is split the workload into independent uh, data blocks, which the DPUs operate on independently. And th third, use as many working DPUs in the system as possible in order to maximize the parallelism. And the fourth, launch at least 11 tasklets or software threads per DPU. We also talk about how to perform uh, the data movement between the main memory and the PIM enabled memory. That, that, those are what we call the CPU to DPU and DPU to CPU data transfers. And we um, uh, studied that there are three different ways of performing these transfers. The first one are the serial transfers where we target a single DPU or a single NRAM bank. The second one are the parallel CPU, DPU or DPU CPU transfers where we uh, target multiple DPUs or multiple MRAM banks, and finally the broadcast CPU DPU transfers, where by uh, targeting multiple uh, DPUs, we transfer a single buffer to all these DPUs. That's why it's, a, it's called a broadcast operation. These um, uh, CPU DPU and DPU CPU data transfers are very important for us because we need to use them to enable inter DPU communication because of the reason that there is no direct communication channel between DPUs. We talk as well about some example communication patterns, for example, merging of partial results to obtain a final result. In this case, we only need to use DPU CPU transfers or the redistribution of intermediate results for further computation. In this case, we need to use DPU CPU and CPU DPU data transfers. Today, we are going to continue talking about them. We will talk a little bit more about uh, different workloads using these communication patterns, and we will see what are the implications of these communication patterns in the performance of the workloads on the admin based PIN system. We talk as well about another uh, important workload, another key primitive for parallel programming is the parallel reduction. We discuss how to implement this parallel reduction by assigning uh, parts of the input array to the different tasklets running on each DPU, obtaining some local sums, and finally performing a final reduction of the local sums by either using a single tasklet or 
single tasklet or using uh, multiple tasklets in a tree-based reduction that can be implemented in different ways. We talk about barrier-based, um, tree-based reduction, and also handshake-based, tree-based reduction. With uh, all this uh, knowledge about how to program a general purpose processing in memory system, uh, we work as well on uh, identifying uh, different uh, benchmarks that can be different workloads that can be suitable for general purpose processing in memory systems. And this is the reason why we created the print benchmark suite with the goal of uh, the, uh, creating a common set of workloads that can be used to evaluate PIM architectures and in particular the admin PIM architecture, compare software improvements and compilers, compare future PIM architectures and hardware. And um, in order to uh, decide what uh, workloads uh, to turn into a PIM or PRIM benchmarks, we use two key selection criteria. The first one, we selected workloads from different application domains, and also we selected workloads that are memory bound on conventional processor centric architectures. In total, in print benchmarks, there are 14 different workloads and 16 different benchmarks because for two of the workloads, we have two different versions. These are the application domains and the whole list of print benchmarks in its uh, current shape. We have dense and sparse linear algebra benchmarks, databases, data analytics, graph processing, neural networks, etc. All these workloads can be considered memory bound in processor centric systems. And in particular, you can see in this slide, the roof line model obtained with Intel advisor on an Intel Xeon CPU. And as you can see, all the 14 workloads fall in the memory bound area of the roof line. So they are expected to be memory bound in uh, processor centric architectures. And due to that, they are expected uh, or hopefully they will be uh, suitable for processing in memory systems. Print benchmarks are also diverse. They are diverse in terms of memory access patterns because they have sequential, strided, and random access patterns. They are uh, diverse in terms of operations and data types, and also in terms of communication and synchronization, intra-DPU and inter-DPU. Regarding the uh, inter-DPU communication, uh, we uh, find some uh, print benchmarks that um, use inter-DPU communication for result merging. In this case, remember that we only need to use DPU to CPU transfers. A good example of this is a histogram generation where we obtain partial histograms in each of the DPUs. And at the end of the execution, after the kernel terminates, we have to move the partial histograms to the host processor for the host processor to perform final merging of this subhistogram. And, uh, and, and also another inter-DPU communication pattern is the redistribution of intermediate results that we can find uh, typically in uh, graph processing workloads, for example, where we have multiple iterations and in each iteration, we generate a frontier and we have to redistribute the frontier between um, iterations. Other um, uh, workloads that also uh, need this sort of redistribution of intermediate results are, for example, Needleman Bunch. In Needleman Bunch, we are creating a two dimensional matrix um, and uh, we go uh, anti diagonal by anti diagonal. After having computed one anti diagonal, we return the control to the host processor in order for the host processor to launch the next kernel that will execute the uh, or compute the next anti diagonal. In this case, for this redistribution of intermediate results, we have to use both DPU CPU and CPU DPU data transfers. So let's keep learning about this general purpose processing in memory system. And in order to do so, and in order to uh, evaluate this uh, processing in memory system for different types of workloads for these different frame benchmarks, uh, we are going to uh, do a, a, a thorough um, uh, experimental study uh, that is also going to reveal some interesting uh, characteristics or important characteristics that will make uh, real world workloads suitable or not for this general purpose um, uh, processing in memory system, this admin architecture. So let's go with the benchmark evaluation. First of all, let's talk about our evaluation methodology. We evaluate the 16 print benchmarks on two admin based PIN systems of different size. The first one is a large 
uh, pin base uh, pin system with uh, 2,556 DPUs. The second one is a smaller one with only 640 DPUs. On these systems, we perform strong and weak scaling experiments. In particular, we are going to show you results on the larger system uh, for uh, those who need a refresher on what's a strong and weak scaling. A strong scaling refers, uh, refers to how the execution time of a program solving a particular problem varies with the number of processors for a fixed problem size. While weak scaling refers to how the execution time of a program solving a particular problem varies with the number of processors for a fixed size problem uh, for a fixed size problem uh, for a fixed problem size per processor we perform uh, strong scaling experiments on one dpu uh, changing the number of tasklets uh, per dpu we also perform a strong and weak scaling experiments on one rank remember that one rank has 64 uh, dpus and we also uh, perform a strong scaling experiments on up to 32 ranks after that uh, we compare as well the performance and the energy consumption of the admin based pin systems uh, to uh, a state of the art uh, CPUs and GPUs, in particular an Intel Xeon and a Titan and NVIDIA Titan 5. In this slide, you can see the different data sets that we use for a strong and weak scaling experiments. These are the data sets for uh, one DPU and one rank for 32 ranks. This is the data set for weak scaling. And these are the M RAM, W RAM transfer sizes that we have used in our experiments. And here they are for reproducibility of our results. Uh, in our publicly available repository, you can find all codes, scripts, and data sets that we have used in our evaluation. Let's start with the strong scaling experiments on one DPU. Um, in these strong scaling experiments on one DPU, what we do is we change the number of tasklets or software threads on the DPU um, uh, from uh, 1 to 16. And in the experimental results in the plots, we show the breakdown of the execution time for the DPU kernel time. So it's the execution time of the kernel running uh, inside the DPU, the inter-DPU uh, communication, uh, the time for inter-DPU communication via the host CPU, the CPU to DPU data transfers, the DPU to CPU data transfers. And finally, we also show the speed up of the DPU kernel over the um, performance of the DPU kernel for a single task yet. So uh, let's start with some uh, observations here. One thing that we can observe is that for the majority of the kernels, the best performing number of tasklets is 16. We observe uh, linear speed ups, so something between 1.5 and 2.0 uh, times um, uh, higher speed up when we increase or when we double the number of tasklets from 1 to 8, and then uh, a slightly lower speed up, something between 1.2 and 1.5 times when we increase the number of tasklets from 8 to 16. The reason for that is that the pipeline throughput, as you may remember from the corresponding lecture, saturates at 11 tasks. So one key observation is that a number of tasklets greater than 11 is a good choice for most real world workloads that we tested, in particular for 16 kernels out of 19 kernels that we have in the 16 print benchmarks. And the reason is that 11 or more tasklets fully utilize the DPU pipeline. Another observation is that there are several workloads that don't use intra-DPU synchronization primitives. While in others, there is intra-DPU synchronization, but this is pretty lightweight. Um, the, as a result, uh, we see that the workloads scale uh, nicely, these workloads scale nicely, and we obtain the highest performance with uh, six, 16 tasklets. However, there are three workloads that um, use mutexes, and this causes contention when accessing shared data structures and in some way limits the scalability of these workloads. For example, for one of the versions of the histogram calculation, uh, we can observe that the lowest DPU execution time or the lowest DPU kernel time uh, occurs for only eight tasklets. So that's the um, uh, case where we obtain the uh, highest speed up. 
The reason for that is that this uh, long, this version of the of the histogram uses mutexes, and every time that an, uh, an, an, a tasklet wants to update uh, one bin in the histogram, needs to lock the access to the histogram, and and it, it will only only be this tasklet, the one that will be updating the histogram while the others have to wait before accessing the critical section to update the histogram. So intensive use of intra-DPU synchronization across tasklets using mutexes, barriers, handshakes, et cetera, may limit scalability and sometimes causing that the best performing number of tasklets is lower than 11. There is another observation. This uh, scan SSA, in particular, the ad kernel is not compute intensive. In this case, the performance saturates with less than 11 tasklets. But the reason for that is not related to the use of synchronization primitives because this uh, ad kernel of scan SSA doesn't use any um, intra DPU synchronization primitives. The reason is that this is uh, like. Uh, it's not a compute intensive workload. It's more like a, a memory intensive workload. And in this case, what happens is that the latency of accesses to MRAM, the data movement between MRAM and WRAM, this latency is hiding the latency uh, in the pipeline. So even though most of the workloads are in the compute bound region of the DPUs, and that's why we expect that most of the workloads saturate at 11 or more tasklets, there are some workloads in particular in the print benchmark suite, we have one kernel in scan SSA and also the uh, BES binary Search um, benchmark, they are memory bound on the uh, uh, on the uh, DPUs and, um, and, and 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 they are uh, so. In this case, the um, uh, memory access latency uh, dominates over the pipeline latency. Okay, so one uh, some more observations. The amount of time spent on CPU, DPU, and DPU CPU transfers is low compared to the time spent on the DPU execution for most of the workloads. Um, it's uh, only in this um, transposition benchmark where uh, the CPU DPU transfer is actually performing one step of the matrix transposition, and that forces us to use a small transfers of only uh, eight elements. And um, these, uh, what what this causes is that we are not uh, fully exploiting the CPU DPU bandwidth, and that's why we see this. Um, large uh, uh, CPU, DPU uh, communication time. But in general, transferring large data chunks from to the host CPU is preferred for input data and output results due to higher sustained CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU bandwidths, as we could see in our previous lecture for the microbenchmark experiments that we showed uh, for the uh, communication between the host and the PIM enabled memory between CPU and DPUs. Now let's move to the strongest scaling experiments on one rank. In this case, we set the number of tasklets to the best performing one per DPU as we have obtained in the previous experiments on a single DPU. And we change the number of DPUs from one to 64 inside the same rank. The breakdown of execution time shows the DPU kernel time, the inter-DPU uh, communication time via the host CPU, the CPU-DPU transfer time, the DPU-CPU transfer time, and the speed up all over one DPU. So let's take a closer look at the results. Uh, one first thing that we see that for most of the print benchmark, we see that the uh, strong scaling experiments on one rank scale linearly with the number of DPUs. However, scaling is sublinear for BFS and NW. In BFS, the problem is that uh, different DPUs suffer from load imbalance due to the irregular graph topology. So the amount of computation that is assigned to each DPU is not exactly the same, and this load imbalance uh, limits the scalability. While in middleman bunch the thing is that even though we might be using the maximum number of DPUs, in the end, in each iteration of the algorithm, we just need to use as many DPUs as really needed to compute uh, one of the anti-diagonals of the 2D matrix. And because the size of the anti-diagonals is not 
regular. In some cases, we would be using more DBUs for, for the larger diagonals, while for the shorter diagonals, we don't, we don't use uh, all DPUs. So that's the reason why in the overall execution of the algorithm, we don't see linear scaling. One or more observation is that these uh, benchmarks, VA, GMB, SPMB, VS, TS, and transpose uh, do not need inter-DPU synchronization. While in others, uh, they need inter-DPU synchronization, but 64 DPUs is still obtain the best overall performance. However, there are these three workloads, BFS, MLP, and Middleman Bunch that require heavy inter-DPU synchronization involving DPU, CPU, and CPU, DPU transfers. And that's why um, we see that for these three workloads with the red uh, apron, the uh, inter-DPU communication time is clearly noticeable. Another interesting observation is that for all these uh, benchmarks, we can use parallel transfers. And uh, the CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfer times decrease as we increase the number of TPUs because we are using parallel transfers. Uh, in the case of uh, BS and MW, uh, we use parallel transfers, but the uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU data transfers, uh, the data transfer time uh, do not uh, seem to be uh, significantly reduced. Uh, there are reasons for that. In the case of BS, we are transferring a complete array to all DPUs. So even though we are using more DPUs, we are not reducing the um, amount of data that we have to transfer per DPU. Uh, while in MW, uh, it happens uh, something related to what we just described about the scalability of the DPU kernel. The problem in NW is that we are not using all DPUs in all iterations. So we are not parallelizing transfer, the transfers over all DPUs, but only over those that we are really using for the calculation um, of each uh, anti-diagonal. Then we see that in SPMB, select, unique, and BFS, they cannot use parallel transfers because the transfer size per DPU is not, not fixed. So one programming recommendation here is parallel CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers inside the rank of DPUs are recommended for real-world workloads when the um, uh, transferred buffers are all of the same size. Remember that if we don't have um, buffers to transfer from or to uh, the different DPUs of the same size, we'll have to use uh, serial transfers. Let's move now uh, to the experiments on 32 ranks, a strong excelling experiments on 32 ranks. Again, we set the number of tasks per DPU to the best performing one, and we change the number of DPUs from 256 to 2048 uh, DPUs. Uh, here we show the breakdown of execution time, and in particular, we show the DPU kernel time and the inter DPU um, communication time. We do not include in these um, plots the uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfer times. And finally, we also show the speed up over 256 DPUs. Let's take a closer look at the results. So as we can see for all these benchmarks, we see that the performance scales linearly with the number of DPUs. However, for these three workloads, SPMB, BFS, and NW, uh, we don't see linear scaling due to load imbalance. So load imbalance across DPUs ensures linear reduction of the execution time spent on the DPUs uh, for a given problem size when all available DPUs are used as we observe in these astronomic scaling experiments. Another observation is that these benchmarks only need to merge uh, partial results. So the overhead of merging partial results from DPUs in the host CPU is tolerable across all prim benchmarks uh, that needed it. As you can see, the inter-DPU communication time or inter-DPU time is uh, quite uh, negligible in, for these workloads. However, for other workloads, they have more complex communication patterns, and that these more complex communication patterns involving both transfers from DPU to CPU and from CPU to DPU uh, impose a significant overhead when we increase uh, the number of DPUs that we are using in the system, and this limits the scalability to more DPUs. Finally, uh, I'm going to also show you some uh, results on weak scaling on a single rank. 
In this case, weak scaling, we have equally sized problems uh, per DPUs, or we are increasing the, the size of the total problem as we increase the number of DPUs. And one key observation from these results is that equally sized problems assigned to different DPUs and little or no DPU synchronization lead to linear weak scaling of the execution time spent on the DPUs. That's something that uh, we can observe, for example, here for BA, uh, for uh, GMV, even from SPMB, and many uh, other of the uh, print benchmarks. We see linear scaling because essentially the kernel time remains flat as we increase the problem size and the uh, number of DPUs. Uh, these are the results for BA, uh, as we see flat uh, DPU kernel time. However, we see that even though we are using parallel transfers in BA and in other benchmarks, the sustained bandwidth of the parallel CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers inside the rank of DPUs increases, but it increases sublinearly with the number of DPUs. So let's continue with the, um, uh, this experimental characterization. Now, comparison to CPU and GPU, let's talk about the evaluation methodology in these experiments. We compare uh, both admin based pin systems to a state of the art CPU and GPU, an Intel Xeon and an NVIDIA Titan 5 GPU. We use uh, state of the art CPU and GPU counterparts of the print benchmarks that you can also find uh, in our repository. And we use in these experiments the largest data set that we can fit in the the uh, GPU memory. We show the overall execution time, including the DPU kernel time and the inter-DPU communication time. So that's what you're going to see uh, in the next plot. In this plot, we uh, show in the y-axis the speed up over the, the CPU. And then as you can see, we are going to see some bars for the uh, different uh, print benchmarks. There are some of these print benchmarks are um, uh, identified are as more suitable uh, for uh, the uh, PIN system. Uh, others are less suitable for the PIN system. And here you can see this geo mean of the first, the second group, and the overall uh, geo mean for all 16 workloads. So one first observation is that both PIN systems outperform the CPU for all benchmarks as, except SPMB, BFS, and Middleman Bush. And both admin based pin systems are respectively 93 times and 27.9 times faster than the CPU for 13 of the print benchmarks. So, all print benchmarks except SPMB, BFS, and NW. Another observation is that the larger uh, admin based pin system outperforms the GPU for 10 of the 16 print benchmarks with an average of 2.54 times. And the performance of the smaller admin based pin system is within 65% the performance of the GPU for the same 10 print benchmarks. Key observation here is that the admin based pin system can outperform a state of the art GPUs on workloads with three characteristics that are the key characteristics of these 10 workloads where the larger pin system outperforms the state of the art GPU. And these three characteristics are, first, streaming memory access patterns, second, no or little inter-DPU synchronization, and third, no or little use of integer multiplication, integer division, or floating point operations. Remember that these complex operations are not natively supported by the um, um, by the uh, admin ISA. So they are emulated and that uh, causes a significant reduction of the compute throughput. So workload with these three key characteristics uh, are potentially suitable uh, to the uh, admin team architecture. In terms of energy, we also uh, uh, cluster the results in a similar way for more pin suitable workloads, less pin suitable workloads. And here you can see the different geo means. We could only run energy experiments on the smaller um, admin based pin system. Uh, the, the energy measurement wasn't uh, available, wasn't enabled in the larger uh, pin system. But in the smallest, uh, in the smaller pin system, we already observed some interesting energy results. On average, this uh, 640 DPU system uh, consumes uh, 
1.64 less energy than the CPU for all 16 print benchmarks. And actually for 12 of the print benchmarks, the PIM system provides energy savings of 5.23 times over the CPU. So key observation here is that the admin based PIM system provides large energy savings over the state of the art CPU due to the higher performance and thus the lower static energy and the less data movement between memory and processors. Second observation here is that the admin based PIN system provides energy savings over state of the art CPU GPU on workloads where it outperforms the CPU or the GPU. And this is because the source of both performance improvement and energy savings is the same. The significant reduction in data movement between the memory and the processor cores, which the admin based PIN system can provide for PIN suitable work. In order to uh, finish this lecture, let me give you some key takeaways or of our analysis. The first key takeaway was already covered in a previous lecture when we uh, discussed the micro benchmarking of the DPUs and the, the admin PIM architecture. We observed that the uh, admin PIM architecture or the DPUs have a memory bound region and a compute bound region and the throughput saturation point that is the um, uh, the, the, the frontier between the memory bound region and the compute bound region is pretty low uh, for all uh, data types and operations. So the key takeaway was that the admin PIM architecture is fundamentally compute bound. So we um, are going to expect that most of the workloads, or workloads that we port to this new architecture will fall in the compute bound region of these um, uh, of the DPUs. Uh, so as a result, we also expect that the most suitable workloads for the architecture are those that are clearly memory bound in processor centric systems. The second key takeaway, as we have discussed in this lecture, is that the most well suited workloads for the admin team architecture use no arithmetic operations or use only simple operations, right? such as bitwise operations or integer addition and subtraction. And they essentially uh, avoid uh, complex operations that are emulated like integer, uh, multiplication and division, and uh, floating point operations. The third key takeaway is that the most well-suited workloads for the admin PIM architecture require little or no communication across DPUs, so no inter-DPU communication. And finally, or last key takeaway, uh, the admin based PIN system outperforms uh, state of the art CPUs in terms of performance and energy efficiency on most of print benchmarks. They outperform state of the art GPUs on a majority of print benchmarks, and we think that the outlook is even more positive for future PIN systems, keeping into account that this admin based PIN architecture is only three years old while. GPUs and CPUs have been optimized in terms of software, hardware, and architecture over decades. And the admin based PIN systems are more energy efficient than state of the art CPUs and GPUs on workloads that they provide performance improvements over CPUs and GPUs. You can find uh, the summary of these uh, key takeaways in our short paper that was presented at the CAD workshop in 2021. And you can find all the results, all the workloads, key observations, programming recommendations, etc., in the uh, longer version of our work that you can find in archive. Remember as well that uh, all our workloads, data sets, benchmarks, and micro benchmarks uh, are publicly available in our repository. In upcoming lectures, uh, we will continue talking about more real world processing in memory architectures. We will also talk about uh, processing using memory architectures and uh, prototypes, and also a few more important topics uh, on uh, processing in memory. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture, found it useful, and um, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me whenever you need to uh, clarify any questions related to this course. And, um, and um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention.